I'm the player of uh, welcoming you all here today. Uh, we have a distinguished guest, uh, Ethan Casey, who has come all the way from Seattle and is uh, writing a book uh, on America um, and driving around uh, visiting various communities in, in, in the U.S. Uh, he's written a couple of books on Pakistan and uh, a couple of books on Haiti as well. Uh, he has traveled extensively uh, throughout South Asia. Um, I don't know uh, other parts of the world, but uh, I'm definitely Haiti. Uh, he has a vast experience. Uh, he's a veteran international journalist and author. Uh, so welcome, uh, Ethan Casey here. It is an honor for me to introduce Ethan Casey. Actually, we are also both for him. Uh, a veteran international journalist, editor, and author. In many ways, he may resemble Ibn Battuta and Marco Polo, who themselves travel to faraway lands. However, he also gets the credit of putting his experiences in writing, helping easing down the fear of unknowns in these dangerous times that particularly Pakistan is facing in modern history. Ethan has traveled throughout the subcontinent in the 1990s, including Jammu and Kashmir state. He has written two books about his experiences in Pakistan, Alive and Well in Pakistan, A Human Journey in Dangerous Time in 2004, and I think it was republished in 2005 again. And another book called Overtaken by Event, A Pakistan Roadmap that he wrote in 2010. He writes often for Dawn, a newspaper for Pakistan, and contributes to Huffington Post. He also writes on his own website, ethankc.com, and is also a public speaker. He does all that to help improve Americans' awareness of both the historic and the contemporary situation in Pakistan, Haiti, and other parts of the world. Ethan Casey is originally from Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin, and considers himself a Westerner who belongs in Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ethan Casey. I come from deep within the heart of, of middle America. I grew up, the town I grew up in in Wisconsin, Oconomowoc, uh, is, is an all-white town of 10,000, I guess now 15,000 people. Uh, it's exactly the kind of American place that needs to, where, whose people need to understand Pakistan and Pakistanis better. And I think a lot of effort needs to be made by people in places like Oconomowoc, um, and surely like Cary, North Carolina, and Greenville, South Carolina, where I was yesterday. Um, and also effort, I think, needs to be made by Pakistani American communities to, to reach out to people in places like Oconomowoc and Kerry. So um, my work, again, with reference to Nadeem, Nadeem Saab's remarks, I, I'm, I'm a little bit overwhelmed uh, to be compared to Ibn Battuta and Marco Polo. Uh, but I guess I'll, I'll take that comparison um, with a grain of salt. Uh, there, but uh, it, that also gives me the opportunity to, to mention, uh, to refer to Joseph Campbell, the great scholar of mythology. Uh, Joseph Campbell wrote a, a, a four-volume um, four uh, history or study of, of mythologies all over the world called The Masks of God. And in, in that um, great work, one, one uh, thing that Campbell writes about is that, there, that one of the great... Uh, archetypes of myth mythological stories is of the young man who leaves his village, leaves his tribe or his community, and goes out into the world and has an adventure, and then comes back and brings what Campbell calls a boon back to his own community. So the adventure is, is great. I've had the adventure. I've had many adventures. And in more in recent years, since I moved back to uh, live in America again in 2006, I feel that now it's the time in my life when, when I'm returning to my own community and bringing a boon from the adventure that I've, that I've had in the outside world. And I think that boon that I'm in a position to help share with American society, my own village, is, is a greater awareness of the outside world, of the world beyond America. And, um, and also a, a sense that the, the, the world outside is not scary. And that's, that's a big message that America needs to hear. I've been to that world. I've been 
not all over Pakistan in particular, but I've been many, many places in Pakistan, and I can tell you that it's a lot more interesting and a lot less scary than most Americans think. So a big part of what we together need to do is just continue getting that message across to Americans in many different formats, many different ways. And in a few minutes, I think I'll segue back to, to talking about the ways in which I, I feel we can and should be working together to do that. But I'll start by telling you a little about the background of how I came to, to write the, the books that I've, that I've written. Uh, as Nadeem Sam told you, I've written two books about Pakistan. The first is called Alive and Well in Pakistan, and it was published in 2004. And then in 2010, I published a follow-up to that book called Overtaken by Events, A Pakistan Road Trip. There's a long story to why and how I published the second book, Overtaken by Events. But the, the, the gist of it is, is two things. One, between 2004 and 2009, a lot of things happened in and to do with Pakistan. And any of you who are Pakistani, you know what those things are. The lawyers' movement, the assassination of Benazir Bhutto, the terrorist attack in Mumbai in the fall of 2008, um, and many other things. Uh, that's when events seem to have started ex really accelerating, the, this whole sort of chain of events that we're still that we're still living with um, in and to do with Pakistan and Pakistan's relationship with America. So that was one reason I did the second book. The other reason was that my publisher, uh, which uh, a, a small, good, medium-sized, independent publisher in London called Vision, uh, stopped being helpful to me and stopped making books available to me. I think for reasons that I don't quite understand, but reasons related to the ways that they were struggling in their business. That's relevant because the publishing industry, all media industries, have become very unstable in recent years. And so somebody like me, who is an independent author, is, has, I've been forced into the position, a position that I'm very glad now to be in, of having to do everything for myself and with myself and, and also to reach out very actively to communities like, like yours to, to do the things that I feel it's important for me to do in, in partnership. So I don't have the support of a publisher. I now publish and, and promote and market my own books all myself. I'm building up a whole little company um, to, to continue do that, doing that and to do that in, on a bigger scale. So my, that publisher vision has now gone out of business and I'm now in a position to reprint Alive and Well in Pakistan, which again is something, another thing that I'm going to going to um, circle back to in a few minutes. So, so I, uh, that's why I did the second book, to follow up the, sec the, the first one. But the, and they, they cover the period, together they cover the period basically from 1994 when I first went to India and held Kashmir, and 2009 when I made a six-week road trip from Mumbai to Karachi entirely overland. I've since been to Pakistan one more time. I was in Pakistan uh, for three weeks in February and March 2011. And I made a point of going there then because um, the floods had happened, the, the, the epics, you know, hor horrific floods of the summer of 2010, the monsoon season of 2010, uh, that as probably most of you know, at one point covered 20% of, of Pakistan. I'm especially concerned that the American public noticed the earthquake in Haiti in a big way and responded in a, in a very big way uh, to the earthquake in Haiti. And in the same calendar year, Pakistan had this, these horrific floods, and the American public, public hardly noticed. So uh, that's, that's, uh, that was important to me to, um, to, to bring the, just the awareness of the floods to the mainstream American public. And, and then secondly, but just as importantly, first of all, to, make, to, to try to make Americans aware that the floods had happened in the first place, and second, to try to enlist the sympathy of Americans towards Pakistanis on a human level, to try to get across the point that these are women and children, innocent people who are suffering and losing their homes and in, in many cases dying because of the floods. So that's the reason I went uh, in early 2011. It hap and I went to flood affected areas. I went to the Swat Valley which was severely devastated by the floods, in addition to everything else that its people have suffered in recent years. And I went to two different parts of rural Punjab province, uh, central Punjab near Miawali and Multan, and uh, southern Punjab uh, outside Rahim Yar Khan. 
I purposely avoided the large cities of Pakistan on that trip, partly because as, uh, in, and I avoided enti uh, Lahore entirely, uh, with, uh, with all respect to all the Lahoris in this, in this room, I know that if you, once you set foot in Lahore, that it's really hard to escape because you start getting invited to dinner parties. So um, I just didn't go to Lahore on that trip. Um, but inshallah, I'll go next time. So um, that was my most recent trip to Pakistan. It all began because I was, I was a foreign correspondent based in Bangkok. I spent uh, most of the 90s living in Bangkok, writing for pa newspapers like the Globe and Mail of Toronto, the Boston Globe, uh, the Guardian, the Observer News, News Service out of England, and the South China Morning Post of Hong Kong, as well as other publications. I earned my chops as, a, as an Asia-based uh, freelance journalist, a Westerner who belongs in Asia um, during that time. And Pakistan became an extension of that great Asian adventure of mine. It was before 9-11. So Pakistan, I was able, as a young American who was eager for experience of the world and eager for adventure, I was able to, to experience Pakistan innocently, just ba basically by showing up and saying, Hi, I'm a young American and I'm interested in your country. I'm interested in what's going on here. And then I was able to do that by writing news stories. But the Western world did not have the, 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 the impression of Pakistan that the Western world has had since 9-11 since was not there yet. So it was an innocent experience. It was a great experience for me to visit Pakistan many times in the second half of the 90s. And, um, and then 9-11 happened, and then in 2003, I was invited to, um, I got an email from a Pakistani friend saying, hey, Ethan, do you know anybody who might like to spend a semester teaching at a new university here in Lahore? And that was my friend Isa Daud Pota. I was living in London at the time, and I wrote back to him right away and said, well, I, yeah, I know somebody who'd like to do that. I'd like to do that. So in, on September 11th, 2003, I landed in Lahore from Heathrow. And I spent five months living in Lahore and teaching Pakistani students at Beacon House National University. And that was the first semester of BNU, which has since gone on to become quite, a, quite an impressive, uh, ambitious institution. And um, it was a great experience because previously I had really just, the life of a traveling, of a, an international journalist is you bounce in and out of various countries. You know, this week it's Pakistan, next week it might be uh, Sri Lanka or, or Cambodia. Uh, and, and it can be very jarring and, and disorienting to be bouncing around so much and never to, never to stay in one place or to belong anywhere in particular. So to get to live in Pakistan, it really just sort of cemented my relationship with the country, um, helped me to slow down, helped me to develop friendships that I that inshallah will last you know my lifetime with my students and others. And um, of course, that was also in the context of post 9/11. The, the Western world had started noticing Pakistan and, and not really in a good way. Now, it, as we all know, since then it's just gotten worse. I am blessed to have had, as I said, experience of Pakistan that was innocent and that was, not, that was without reference to all the ugly things that we see on TV. So now that I've come back to live in Pakistan, and, or sorry, come back to live in America since 2006, I feel a big part of my mission, my purpose, is to bring what I call the Pakistan that I know to the mainstream American public, to people like the people in my hometown, uh, Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. Uh, incidentally, the photo on the, on the uh, front co cover of that brochure that, um, that Bubber, the beautiful brochure that Bubber made, uh, that photo is from the bookstore in my hometown, Oconomowoc, Wisconsin, where I did a little event in September of this year. And three, three, um, classmates of mine from high school showed up. So uh, literally, I've been able to, to reach people in, in my own hometown very directly, and, and that's a great uh, a joy to me. So the first passage is um, from September 2003, just a couple of weeks after I arrived to teach at Beacon House National University. The, um, the Pepsi Cup uh, cricket um, tour happened to be happening at the time. And South, the South African national cricket team was, was touring Pakistan. And they came to Qaddafi Stadium in Lahore. And all my Pakistani, I was like, I want to go. I've never seen an actual cricket match before. It was a one-day match, which is good, because I didn't have five days to, to waste <laughs> watching a test match. 
Uh, but I, I actually think one day cricket is a good format if you have a full day. Because um, these guys bat and then these guys bat and it's pretty clear what's going on, right, in the one day, in the one day version. But, uh, so I wanted to go to Qaddafi Stadium and I wanted to sit in, um, I wanted to have a, uh, you know, an experience uh, with ordinary Pakistanis in, uh, uh, in, in Qaddafi Stadium. And all my Pakistani friends said, are you crazy? You definitely don't go to Qaddafi Stadium. Whatever you do, don't sit in the general enclosure, the cheap seats, and definitely don't tell anybody that you're an American. Whatever you do, don't tell anybody you're an American. So of course, I went and I told everybody that I was an American, and I sat in the general enclosure. And I had a wonderful experience. And this passage, I'm going to read you part of what's actually one of the longest single scenes in the book, because it was just all so good I, I couldn't cut it. So I'm sitting in the general enclosure in, in uh, Gaddafi Stadium in Lahore. All around me are young men. They're, they're boisterous, of course. They're, they're chanting slogans and yelling and tossing paper airplanes. And um, a certain group of young guys kind of glommed on to me. Actually, there was some rivalry. You know, oh, he should sit with us. No, he should sit with us. So I ended up sitting with this one group. And, um, and, and one particular young man really, uh, really made it a wonderful experience for me. The coin was being flipped to decide which team would bat first. A bearded man to my left said, Pakistani batsmen are not good chasers. It is a very tender matter what you decide to do. If you decide to bat first and you lose, they will say you were foolish. South Africa won the toss and opted to bowl first. But if Pakistan are not good chasers, South Africa should bat first, I objected. But there is the do problem, he explained patiently. In day and night matches, there is too much do, and it is, it is difficult to hold the ball in your hand. The bearded man was, a, was Mohammed Fessel, a teacher of English and mathematics from a village near Gujranwala, about 100 kilometers from Lahore. He was young, in his 20s. He had arrived that morning with 20 other young men in a Toyota pickup truck. This was his first visit to a proper stadium. He wore a clean shalwar kameez and spoke English slowly but correctly. He might have been any of numerous severe looking bearded men one passed daily in the street. Pakistan's city-fied elite, people like my tennis pals and my university colleagues called such men beardies. He turned out to be a religious cricket fan. Pakistan, shouted someone in the crowd. Zindabad, shouted the entire enclosure as one. Pakistan, Zindabad, Pakistan, Zindabad. Who's going to win? Pakistan will win. Allahu Akbar. God is great. Long live Pakistan. The behavior of the spectators is the same in America, Mohammed Faisal asked me. The raising of the slogans? Oh, yes, I said. Anybody who's been to an American football game knows that that's true. <laughs> Pakistan nation is very lazy, he said. Therefore, they can afford these day-long matches, five-day tests. Which cricket players have you heard of? Imran Khan, I said, and the South African captain who died in a plane crash. Hansi Kronje, he said. Yes, I said. He was corrupt. He was corrupt, he agreed. But he was a very good captain and a very good player. Imran Khan is very famous outside Pakistan, I said. Because of Jemima? <laughs> Partly because of Jemima, I said. But also because he was a great cricket player. Many people didn't want him to marry her, I added, to see what he would say, because she was a Jew. Yes, he said. But she converted to Islam, I said. Yes, Lady Diana was going to accept Islam too. <laughs> The first batsman made out after 19 runs. The man on the other side was uh, of Mohammed Fessel, who had a chubby face that was clean shaven except for a small mustache, said a name and made what looked like the sign of the cross. Excuse me, I said. Yusuf Yohana, said Mohammed Fessel. He is the only Christian player. He is the backbone of the Pakistan team. Yohana hit a, ground, a slow grounder that rolled only a few feet, but he and the other batsmen ran for a run. He is a very good singles hitter, Yusuf Yohana, said Mohammed Fessel. 
A clean-shaven, jolly young guy sat on my other side. He was a Pathan named Naim Khan. He came from the same district as Imran Khan, and he liked him. He speak about politicians, what they do wrong, he said. Do you belong to intelligence? <laughs> no, I said. I don't belong to intelligence. Because you are writing down each and everything we say. <laughs> it is a very childish question, said Mohammed Fessel sternly. A batsman made out by hitting a ball backwards that was caught by the wicketkeeper. It is a game of patience, said Mohammed Fessel. If you want to make runs, you have to stay in. That ball was wide. He should have left it. So that's just a little bit of that long passage. It gives you a sense of, of that scene. Later, at the end of that long day uh, at Qaddafi Stadium, Mohammed Fessel stood and put his hand on his heart and said, it was you who made our journey special. That just me being there was special for him. And I was able to say the same to him. So I'll, um, I'll read another sh uh, brief passage, a couple of pages. This is uh, later in the book. It's, it's more downbeat. Um, it's with a Pakistani friend of mine, uh, a, la a man in late middle age who's, who had migrated from, from northern India, from, from uh, Lucknow, uh, years ago, not, not, out of, uh, not eagerly, but because his family, members of his family, had also ended up in Pakistan. And, and he felt himself to be kind of stranded in Pakistan. A very sad story, I think. But um, we sat in his uh, house in Karachi and had this conversation. Ethan, he said, I accept the point that there is a totalitarianism in Islam. There is that. Islam's contention that the Quran is the last message and that that is the be all and end all is really going to be the battlefield, in my view. Look at it this way. The Jews say they're the chosen people. Islam says it's the final message. The Christians rule the roost. Where does the answer lie? I said, um. It's a facetious question, he said. He saved me. I didn't have to answer. It's a facetious question. The answer actually doesn't lie in any of them. Some Pakistanis thought I was with the CIA. What would Americans think when I told them I was about to go back to America at this point in 2004? What would Americans think when I told them or when they saw in my passport as I entered the country that I had been to Pakistan? Paranoia is one of several traits Americans and Pakistanis share. I wonder what they'll do to me when I go back to the States, I said. Look, he said. Don't misunderstand me, but I really don't think they'll do much. They'll probably just ask you to tell them everything you've learned about Pakistan living here for five months. This was deflating to me, to my ego, but it evoked a happy memory of my mentor, Ed Pettit, in Bangkok. who had uh, Ed Pettit had done some extraordinary things, uh, including exposure, exposing top secret documents to do with the Vietnam War. He was a uh, an unusual man from, from Arkansas whom I met in a Burger King in Bangkok. It's a long story. Um, Ed had said, uh, ha for, for having, he, he went on the radio many times bragging about having exposed these top secret documents. And he, he's always said to me, I wanted to be arrested or interrogated, and I never could be. You can't ever be busted in the US when you want to be. <laughs> OK, said my friend. My Pakistani friend. There's this guy Padilla, Jose Padilla, who was um, uh, an American Muslim who was was persecuted, I think, at Guantanamo Bay. But the cases like him, you can count on one hand. Lind is a different case altogether. This was John Walker Lind, the infamous American Taliban, the young man from Marin County, California, who joined the Taliban. Because he took up arms, I said. Because he took up arms, my friend agreed. As sad a story as that is, it's a different story. I mean, that poor guy, they'll probably release him in 10 years or something, but his life is finished. He's a guy who would have been happy if he had been born in the time of hippies and flower power and all of that. He was born in an upper middle class family, and he felt that affluence was an end, was an end in itself, that truth had nothing to do with it. And he chose the hardest road to truth. 
This knife edge we live on today, my friend continued, is because everyone sees the successes. Nobody sees the failures. Nobody's willing to see the failures. And for every success, there are hundreds of failures. And television plays such a big part in it. When you're sitting every night in front of the TV and it's spewing out this stuff, and you get this, this sense that this is the center of things. This is where it's at. You don't, know how many way, you don't know how many ways I prefer living here to living in the West. At least you're not being bombarded with ads. There's no pressure to keep up. To be upper middle class in Pakistan is to be more independent than in 99% of places today, as long as you can keep away from the mythology. The way I see it, all sides are crazy. So as an individual, what should the response be, I asked. As an individual, I think the response is to isolate yourself. Said, he said, I don't agree. But as a society, let's say it's a melting pot. The various elements in that melting pot have to combine. That's the only hope I see. I really think the world can't take opposing ideologies much longer. And what the West needs to realize is that the ideology that's doing the most damage is not Islam, it's Zionism. It was all going very well when the American economy was going well and the world was following in America's footsteps. Do you mean in the 90s, I asked? Before that, all through the 60s, 70s, 80s. And now that the confrontation with the Soviet Union is no longer there and American leadership should be accepted even more emphatically, it's a manifestation of Bush's failure that he's asserting it through war rather than through any other means. At the tail end of this long and intense conversation, which I scribbled down furiously until my wrist ached, my friend asked that I not publish his name. Dismayed, I remonstrated with him to change his mind. He refused. I've made my compromises with this society, he said, and I'm not willing to expose myself in that way. I'm going out on a limb writing this book, I said. You don't have to come back to Pakistan, he pointed out. But I do have to go back to the States, I said. That's the end of that section. So I'll just say a couple of things. I, I know from experience that, that in this kind, of, uh, this kind of gathering, there's always people have lots of things to say and questions to ask about my views on various matters to do with Pakistan and America. And I'm, I'm happy to share them. And I'm happy to have a conversation with you about whatever is on your mind, whatever uh, concerns you the most, or whatever you feel I or we should be doing. Um, before I do that, I'll just say very quickly a couple of things. I, um, I was in, in Greenville, South Carolina the last two days. This is, this is just a, sort of a case in point of, of why I feel uh, what we're in a position to do is very important. I don't want to single out Greenville because this kind of conversation could have happened anywhere. But I went to two different dinner parties with uh, upper middle class white people in, in Greenville. It was very enjoyable. I, I had a very nice time, enjoyed meeting everybody. And at each dinner, each of the two dinners, I was asked a challenge, at least one challenging question about Pakistan. Last night, a man said, really literally, just as I was sitting down um, on the couch, I had just walked in the front door and introduced myself. He said, I've, I've seen, I read an article or I saw something on TV recently about how Islam, Islam is not modern. Islam is not able to modernize. Muslim people are not able to participate in the modern world. They're stuck in, in the medieval era. What do you think about that? That was kind of basically the way he said it. And I was like, hi, nice to meet you too. <laughs> Um, that's, uh, I mean, that's a whole conversation that we can and should be having. You know, what is the nature of Islam? What is the role of Islam in the contemporary world? What is the role of Muslims in the contemporary world? And I would, I would say, more specifically, what is the role of Pakistanis and of Pakistani Americans? What are, what are we in this room in a position to, to do uh, in this society and in Pakistan to make ourselves useful, to, to help make things better? So, but, but, but uh, the challenging and very sort of uh, self-assured way in which, this, in which this affluent white man told me what he thought he knew about Islam tells us something about uh, what we're up against. 
a lot of Americans think they understand Islam because they've seen TV shows or they've read articles in magazines. Uh, if we want them to understand the Islam that we know, we need to present that to them. We need, and, and particularly you, because I'm not a Muslim. So an, another, a lady at the dinner party two nights ago said something that I hear often, which is, you know, when these atrocities happen, when things blow up and the Taliban does things like attacking this girl, et cetera, et cetera, why don't Muslims come out and condemn those things? And she didn't say, do Muslims come out and condemn those things? She said, why don't they? I know darn well, as my grandmother would say, that Muslims all over America and all over the world do come out and condemn every atrocity immediately as soon as it happens because I'm on all the email lists of all the organizations. And I know that, that Muslims all around America and all around the world are doing everything that they know how to do to, to get the word out about how this is not Islam. We are Islam. We are Muslims. Those people who commit the atrocities are not doing, they not, they're not representing Islam. What I said to this lady was, was exactly that. Muslims do condemn every atrocity as soon as it happens, um, but Americans don't listen, Americans don't hear them. That's partly the fault of Americans for not listening and for paying too much attention to other things. There's so much to pay attention to, from football to the bachelorette to you know, the, the election, whatever else, so, you know, but it's also, it's all, it also represents um, not a fault or a failure, but it represents a limitation of what we are, we as Pakistanis and friends of Pakistan and, and Muslims and friends of Muslims are trying to do, which is we can and should be doing what we're already doing on a bigger scale and, and more assertively. I, I think that the civil rights movement in the United States sets a, is, is a great model for what we could be doing in terms of being assertively involved in public life. There are dangers and risks in doing that. I've written about this. I'm, you know, I'm not the one who should say that there should be a movement, but I think if we think in terms of a movement, that might be a helpful thing to do. I'll, um, before I pause, I want to tell you two anecdotes. One anecdote and one sort of little uh, provocative recommendation. And I'll, I'll save other things for, for after, we, after I pause and we, and we have a conversation. But um, two things. One, I, was, I spoke at a masjid. No, I didn't speak. I was a guest at a, a high school in central New Jersey, Monmouth Junction, New Jersey, that's connected to um, a, a masjid in uh, October 2010. And the event was local members of the, of the members of the local community, the local non-Muslim community, had been invited to spend the afternoon at this high school masjid and uh, interact with the teenagers. This uh, particular school, by the way, uh, Nur al-Iman School, uh, has a 100% college acceptance rate for, rate for its graduates. Its graduates go to places like Princeton and Columbia and Yale, you know, as, as many of you know, the young people of the Pakistani American community are one of the great beacons of hope, not just for this community, but for America as a whole. So these very impressive young people had a conversation for a couple of hours with members of the local community, and it was on all the subjects that, that you might expect, all the subjects that are on all of our minds. And near the end, after the young people had talked about, you know, sometimes it's difficult to be a Muslim in American society, um, Sometimes, you know, we feel, we feel uh, you know, besieged or, 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 uh, or misunderstood. An older woman in the audience raised her hand and she said, I'd like to say something. I grew up here in New Jersey and 50 years ago, I used to come home from school crying because my classmates called me um, kike and, and um, Christ killer and other slurs against Jews and I would come home crying to my father. And my father always said to me, hold your head up high and be proud of who you are. And she said, I wanna say the same thing to you. you know, you're all the same age that I was 50 years ago. And to me, just witnessing that, it was one of the most moving um, moments I've, I've been privileged to witness in recent years. And I think it points to uh, something it just points to the great potential that, that I think we're, we, we can work towards in American society. 
to do with the, the position of Muslims here. And then the provocative suggestion is, I was just, as, as um, I think Nadim told you, I'm driving around America, I'm writing a new book, it's going to be called Home Free, an American Road Trip, it'll be published next year. It will include, by the way, uh, Pakistani communities in different parts of the country, and that's one of my ways of sort of sneaking in stories about Pakistanis and Muslims into a, a book that's, that's otherwise about America. So Americans will buy it, but then they'll get a little more than they bargained for. But um, so on this road trip that I'm, I'm currently on, a couple of weeks ago I was in Massachusetts and um, I spent some days with some gay people in Massachusetts. That's one of the, you know, Massachusetts was the first state that legalized gay marriage, as you know. That's a controversial issue and it's not an issue that I'm here to talk about tonight. But what my gay friends told me was something very interesting that I think might, um, we might want to keep in mind. As you know, issues to do with the gay community in America are front and center in recent years. And the, the agenda of, of the gay community has been advanced greatly in recent years, whether you like that or not. But one reason it's been, a, the main reason that agenda has been advanced nationally in the United States is that that community has been very proactively um, assertive in, in American political life. And so here's an example of what they've done among many other things. There's a, every year in July, gay men go to Disney World and they, and they have t-shirts. They print thousands of t-shirts, red t-shirts, and they say whatever, but they're red. And they show up at Disney World and they just do Disney World. You know, they ride the rides and, and whatever. And anybody who's at Disney World that day sees the sea of red t-shirts and gets the point. You know, we have money and we're here and, and we vote and we are a community that insists on being reckoned with. By the way, any straight man who happens to show up wearing a red t-shirt that day, Disney World has a booth where you can go and get a free white t-shirt to replace it. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so not, you know, not to belabor the point, but I think in some ways the point is obvious. How about green t-shirts? How about green t-shirts at Disney World? All right, that's all I'll say for now. I, I, um, I have a few other things I want to say, and I'll save those. For, I'm sure we'll have other opportunities, but either we'll eat now or we'll eat uh, in a few minutes, and I'll, I'm hap very happy to have a conversation on any point that I raised or any point that I didn't raise. There's uh, obviously a lot to talk about. Thank you.